Today on the Perception in Action podcast. Can assisting or guiding movement using devices such as robots, elastic bands, or pulleys speed skill acquisition? Should we be using them to reduce movement errors or amplify them? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Imagine if we could somehow allow you to feel what it's like to swing a tennis racket like Serena Williams, throw a football like Tom Brady, or swing a golf club like Jordan Spieth. Would experiencing the movement patterns of elite athletes help you to acquire these skills faster? Or imagine that we used equipment that allows you to swing a bat faster than your current maximum velocity, or jump higher on a volleyball serve than you're currently capable of. Would this type of overspeed or overheight training facilitate motor learning? These are the questions I want to tackle in today's episode. In doing so, I want to look at everything from very advanced technologies like robotics, to more low-tech solutions like elastic bands. Note that I'm focusing on using these assistive devices to acquire sports-related skills. They are also used for other purposes like rehabilitation and in medicine that I won't be touching on today. So let's dive in. To start off with, I want to look at technologies which guide movements. As an example, consider the RoboGolf Pro, which is what is shown on the artwork for today's episode. I have also included a video of it in action in the show notes. This device is essentially a large robotic arm that attaches to the middle of the shaft of a regular golf club. The player stands in front of the robot and swings their club like they're on a practice range. The robot adds forces during the swing movement so as to alter the length, speed, and plane of the swing in different ways. For example, by adding forces, it can make you use a steeper swing path than you normally would. So, the robot is serving to temporarily alter the task dynamics during the movement. That is, the relationship between the forces you as the golfer apply and the resulting motion that occurs. Note that although this all sounds very futuristic, this type of assisted training has been around for a long time. Lower tech examples include hand-over-hand training in many sports, where a coach holds on to an athlete in some way to guide their movement, overhead cables which gymnasts use in practice, and even training wheels on a bicycle. Of course, robots allow for much more precise guidance of movement, including making it feel like you're moving through a force field or bouncing off a springy wall, and have the added advantage that they can monitor performance and give feedback. Why might we expect guiding an athlete's movement during practice to be beneficial for acquiring new skills? An assertion that's often referred to as the guidance hypothesis. In thinking about this, as with any sports training, it's critical to distinguish between performance and learning effects. For most lesser skilled athletes, if we program the robotic assistance system to follow the movement of a lead athlete, it will result in better immediate performance. For example, a golfer is likely to hit a golf ball straighter and further when using the RoboGolf Pro than they do on their own. But this does not equate to motor learning, of course. While there's no doubt the assistance will improve performance when it's turned on, will it have any positive lasting benefits once it's switched off? It has been proposed that guiding a learner's movements can help with two different aspects of motor learning, trajectory learning and transformation learning. Trajectory learning involves learning to control the basic spatiotemporal pattern of movement of an end effector, such as your hand or a piece of equipment. Transformation learning involves learning to adapt this basic movement pattern you have developed to be responsive to changes in the environmental conditions. So sticking with golf, trajectory learning involves developing a general swing path. Transformation learning involves being able to alter it when you're standing on a downhill slope while swinging, for example. Another way to think of it is the development versus parameterization of the motor program in Schmidt's schema theory. In terms of why assisting movement might facilitate these processes, four different potential learning mechanisms have been discussed. First, if we believe that learning is primarily a motivational reward-based system, for example as proposed in Wolf and Luthwaite's optimal theory, which I discussed back in episode 80, then if we use the robotic assistance to make a new learner move like an elite athlete, 
motor learning should be facilitated because there will be smaller and fewer performance errors. Similar ideas have also been proposed in the errorless learning approach used by masters and colleagues, which I've discussed back in episode 16. Relatedly, reducing errors using assistance could encourage implicit learning by reducing conscious processing. But what if instead we believe that learning is an error-based process, where hypothesis testing and correcting movements is essential for developing new skills? Well, this could be potentially facilitated by robotic assistance too. But in this case, we would want to augment performance errors rather than reduce them so that you move like an elite. For example, in golf, we could exaggerate a golfer's slice so that they feel the movements that are causing it. This again points to the distinction between performance and learning. It is possible that we could make you learn better by making you perform worse. I will look at research that has directly compared error reduction and error augmentation in a few moments. Another way to think about the control of errors in this type of system is in terms of convergent and divergent forces. If we program the system with a quote-unquote ideal movement pattern and want it to be error-reducing, the forces would be convergent. Convergent forces pull us back to the ideal trajectory and would get stronger the further we are away from it. If instead we wanted to augment errors, we would use divergent forces. That is, the robotic system would try to pull our movement away from the ideal trajectory with the forces again becoming stronger the further away we are from it. With such a system, it would also be possible to help keep a performer near their challenge point. For example, we could use more error reduction for novices and transition to error augmentation as their performance improves. A third mechanism by which movement assistance might aid motor learning is observational learning. Although when most people hear this term, they think about visually experiencing an action, robotic assistance can be thought of as a type of proprioceptive observational learning. It's getting you to experience the feel of the movement. Just as visual observation of a sporting task might activate motor neurons involved in generating that same movement yourself, as I discussed back in episode 20, being guided through a movement haptically by a robot might activate a similar process in your somatosensory system, which receives signals from your receptors in your skin, muscles, and joints. There is some evidence from fMRI studies that there is overlap between neural structures involved in sensing and executing actions in this system too. A final learning mechanism associated with movement guidance or assistance that has been proposed is that it might serve to increase the amount of perceptual motor space that is experienced by the performer in training. That is, it could be used to make the athlete experience body positions and movement patterns they would never come up with on their own. Okay, we've looked at some of the reasons that a robotic assistance might help motor learning. Let's now look at some reasons why it might not help or even be detrimental to the skill acquisition process. First, it's important to emphasize that although these devices might allow you to quote unquote experience what it's like to move like an elite, you're never actually moving like an elite athlete. Although the head of your tennis racket might actually follow the same trajectory that Serena Williams does, in her case, she's completely controlling all of the movement, while you are not. In other words, we are experiencing the correct movement path, but not the correct movement forces. This could be problematic for several reasons. First, it could lead to a very passive role for motor control. If this system is going to help pull you on the right path anyways, there is little reason to carefully plan your movement or make sure it's initiated with any precision. Second, during practice you would essentially be teaching a performer to adapt to a new dynamic environment in which there are strong internal and external forces on movement. Given what we know about the specificity of motor learning, it doesn't seem likely there would be positive transfer when the assistance is taken away. Third, it is possible that these assistance systems would decrease autonomy and instead result in a feeling of dependency in the performer. And finally, although assistive devices might allow a performer to experience a larger area of perceptual motor space, it's critical that this would not be a process guided by the performer themselves. Thus, it would not support and might actually interfere with self-organization of movement. Okay, there are some of the pros and cons. What does the research actually tell us about the effectiveness of movement assistance systems? As is the case with most motor learning research, 
A large part of what has been done on this topic has involved the use of very simple motor tasks like key pressing or reaching to a target. But there has been some work done on sports-related tasks too. Let's first look at the research on trajectory learning, asking the question, can assistance help you learn a basic movement pattern? This can be further subdivided into spatial and temporal components. Spatial refers to whether or not you can learn to move the end effector through a particular path in space, while temporal refers to the control of dynamic features of the movement, such as the velocity. In terms of the spatial aspect, there is little, if any, evidence that assisting movement aids motor learning. If anything, it's been shown to hurt it. An example of this type of research is the 2015 study of rowing by Sigrist and colleagues. In this study, 24 novices were trained in a virtual reality rowing simulator. Participants were divided into three training groups. A visual group who were shown a visual representation of the path of their oar movement that was superimposed on a target expert path. An audio-visual group that saw the same visual display plus their oar movements were sonified, and, of most interest to the topic today, a visuo-haptic group, who were shown the display and had their oar movements controlled by a convergent force field, produced by an elastic torque so as to reduce errors from the ideal target oar path. The difference between the actual and target oar path was measured pre- and post-training and on a retention test one day later. For all of these, no feedback or assistance was provided. What was found? Spatial errors were consistently highest for the visual haptic group. Importantly, performance in the visual haptic group was significantly poorer than the visual only group. So in other words, adding the error reduction assistance made things worse. Similar effects have been shown in studies in which participants are required to learn to draw a particular shape with hand movements. For these, no significant benefits of movement assistance have been observed with most showing negative effects of adding it to visual feedback alone. For the reasons I discussed a few moments ago, I don't think these results are all that surprising. When you add error-reducing movement assistance during training, it means that the performer will never actually have to produce the movement pattern that is needed for successful performance during training. Therefore, the retention tests in these studies are really transfer conditions, in which you're asking participants to perform in a dynamic environment that is completely different from what they were trained in. It is also likely that they will become highly dependent on the assistance. To combat these issues, two variants of the basic movement assistance protocol have been proposed. The first involves gradually fading the assistance away during the course of training. So in other words, the error-reducing forces are getting less and less and the performer is required to do more and more controlling on their own. While this sounds like a good idea, to date, the presence or absence of fading during training has not been shown to produce any significant difference. The second idea that has been proposed is to take advantage of movement after effects. Imagine that I wanted to train a baseball batter to have a more upward swing path. One approach would be to use convergent error reduction around an ideal path. So essentially the assistive forces would pull your bat up while you swing. As I mentioned a few moments ago, the problem here is that the batter will never actually produce the required forces for the movement solution themselves, and thus will be likely at a loss when the assistance is taken away. Well, one way to get around this is to use a movement after effect. If instead of using forces to pull the bat up during training, imagine I use forces to pull it down. In this situation, the batter will adapt to the forces and eventually will start producing their same old swing path. But when the assistance is taken away, the batter's resultant swing path will increase due to a negative movement after effect. Thus, they will produce the desired movement on their own. In other words, we're teaching you to produce the correct movement by training you with the completely opposite, incorrect one. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? If you want to see an example of this type of negative movement after effect, check out vlog number 5 on my YouTube channel. This after effect method has been shown to work for some simple motor tasks. For example, if you want to teach someone to draw a leftward bending curve with their finger, they will produce the correct movement pattern if you train them with a rightward bending assistive force, then take it away. However, these type of after effects are extremely short lived, lasting only a couple of trials. So it's highly unlikely they will have any meaningful benefits for skill acquisition in more complex tasks. 
What about training using divergent error augmenting forces that pull the learner away from the desired movement path? Do these result in good trajectory learning? Overall, error augmentation does seem to produce better learning results than error reduction. However, there are two caveats. First, it's been shown that there's no real difference between using divergent error augmenting forces and completely random perturbations of force. Thus, it's not completely clear what's going on here. It has been proposed that using divergent or random perturbations have their effect by provoking increased limb stiffness in performers, which is known to allow for more precise control over movements. The second issue is that to my knowledge, no studies have examined error augmentation of this type for more complex sports-like tasks. So overall, movement assistance does not seem to help and may even hurt the learning of the spatial components of a movement trajectory. What about the temporal components? In 2013, Marshall Crespo and colleagues examined two dynamic components of a tennis forehand stroke in a tennis virtual environment, the timing of movement initiation and the velocity profile of the stroke. A tendon-based robotic system was used to guide movements through the application of forces. In a first experiment, 19 participants were trained to initiate the stroke at a particular point during the simulated ball flight through either visual, the ball changing color, or movement assistance, force being applied to the racket. The accuracy of the virtual shot was used as the dependent measure. What was found? Movement assistance did result in improved accuracy, but only for participants that were lesser skilled at the start of training. For more skilled participants, the visual feedback was more effective. In a second experiment, participants were asked to learn a target velocity profile. So in other words, accelerate and decelerate the racket in a particular way. Again, a visual condition in which a representation of the path on the screen was shown and a movement assistance condition in which convergent error reducing forces were applied by the robot were compared. What was found? The movement assistance was better than the visual condition in terms of producing the ideal velocity profile However, there was no significant improvement pre to post training. So in sum, this study is suggestive that movement assistance might help the learning of the temporal aspects of movement. However, only for really simple aspects like the timing of initiation and only for lesser skilled performers. And of course, transfer to real tennis performance would need to be assessed before we make any firm conclusions. A somewhat similar result was found by Tamagone and colleagues in 2012 using a virtual putting task. In this study, movement assistance consisted of a virtual cone force field, which served to guide the path of the putter head to the simulated ball, and velocity control, which added to or resisted the club movement to ensure a particular impact velocity was achieved. A group that trained using the assistance was compared to a no assistance control group. What was found? Consistent with my earlier discussion of the lack of effects for spatial guidance, the virtual cone did not improve the stroke path or have any effect on putting performance. The velocity assistance training did result in significant reduction in the amplitude of errors post-training. However, this effect seems to be quite limited, as other studies using more complex tasks, including bouncing a ball a certain height and putting to holes at different distances, have found no significant benefits of movement assistance on velocity control. Finally, in 2014, Kummel and colleagues examined the effect of training with the top swing robotic system on the temporal aspect of a golf stroke. This system connects to the handle of a normal golf club and guides its movement by applying forces along six axes. In the study, 31 novice golfers were divided into three groups. Two that performed robot-assisted chip shots, and a control group that did no training. The two assistance groups differed in terms of the wrist progression during the backswing. For the early angle group, the robot applied an early rotation of the club handle, resulting in early abduction of the wrist. While for the late angle group, this force was applied later in the stroke. To assess training effects, each participant performed six unassisted pitch shots pre and post training and during a retention test performed a week later. The main dependent measure was the progression of the wrist angle during the shot, specifically how much it increased. This was chosen because previous research has shown that it's strongly related to both distance and accuracy. What was found? 
For all three groups, the normalized wrist angle during the stroke increased from about 0 to 10 degrees in the pretest. This did not change significantly after training for either the control group or the late angle assistance group. However, for the early angle group, there was a significant change that was retained one week later. Specifically, the wrist angle now increased from 0 to nearly 30 degrees. There were no significant differences in the backswing velocity of the three groups. So in sum, the early angle robotic assistance did result in a significant change in the temporal pattern of the wrist angle in a direction moving closer to the pattern found in more skilled golfers. However, there are a couple important limitations to this study. First, of course, actual shot outcomes were not measured. And second, more importantly, the robotic assistance was not compared to any other type of training, for example, using visual feedback or cueing. Therefore, even though it produced positive outcomes, it's hard to know if it's worth the substantial financial investment required for such a system. Finally, what about transformation learning? Can performers better learn to adapt to changing environmental conditions through movement assistance? The answer seems to be a resounding no. This has been primarily studied using the perturbed reaching paradigm I've talked about a few times on the podcast. To refresh your memory, this involves learning to reach towards a target in conditions where the target moves after you start moving your hand. Movement guidance in these studies has either been error reducing, pulling you towards the new target location, or error augmenting, pushing you away from it. Error-reducing guidance has been shown to result in a significant impairment in learning this task, while error augmentation is not significantly different from just visual feedback alone. Before wrapping up today's episode, I want to briefly look at the use of overspeed and overheight training. These involve the use of assistance in form of elastic bands, harnesses, or pulleys to allow an athlete to experience faster speeds and higher jump heights than they normally produce on their own. Do these have any benefits for motor learning? In terms of the performance on the basic task that was trained, the answer seems to be yes. Overtraining does seem to lead to faster running speeds and higher jump heights post-training. However, this does not seem to extend to more complex coordination tasks. For example, in a study published earlier this year, Rivera and colleagues examined the effect of assisted hip rotation on increasing the velocity of a baseball swing. 21 male and female players were asked to hit a ball off a tee. Assistance was in the form of a harness, which added to the force of torso rotation as a function of the hitter's body weight. What was found? There was no significant effect of the hip rotation assistance on bat velocity. To sum up, in today's episode I looked at whether movement assistance or guidance can aid motor learning. In terms of guiding a learner along some ideal movement path, there's very little, if any, evidence to support the idea that this is beneficial and results suggest it might even impair skill acquisition. Even when positive effects are found, for example in improving the temporal profile of movement patterns, the benefits only seem to occur for very simple tasks and for very unskilled performers. And it's not been demonstrated that they are better than other instructional methods. So, if you try a demo of one of these devices, don't be lured by the fact it makes you better in the moment. That is performance, not learning. If anything, results from these studies I discussed today suggest that error augmentation, in other words making you perform badly, results in better learning with these systems. What are the take-home messages for coaches from today's episode? Well, obviously I would recommend that you give any system which tries to make your athlete move like an expert a hard pass. There's no evidence that they work. If you want to explore some type of movement assistance and training, I think low-tech solutions like elastic bands are the better way to go. And instead of trying to guide the performer through an idealized movement pattern, I think it's better to think of them as constraints or perturbations, which encourage exploration of perceptual motor space and self-organization. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Yeah.